I'm Laura Shefsack, scientific editor at Cell, and I'm here today with Arshad Desai from the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in University of California, San Diego. It's really nice to be chatting with you. Thanks, Lara. So your lab focuses on, part of your lab focuses on how kinetic cores tie in to the cell cycle. What got you interested in that question? Yeah, so I think one of the most striking things since you're a young student, if you were even in junior high and you look at, uh, learn about mitosis, one of the things when you watch a movie of mitosis is this incredibly synchronous segregation of the chromosomes where you somehow they seem to know exactly when to go. And I've always been sort of fascinated by how you coordinate such a complex cellular scale process such that it occurs with such remarkable synchrony. And work from the field and over the years, we have appreciated that the kinetochore is a key orchestrator of this process. And we now know that one of the mechanisms it does is by um, controlling the activity of the main enzyme that drives cells out of mitosis. And I presented work at the meeting to, uh, about how kinetochores are also promoting the activity that drives cells out of mitosis. And we believe this sort of uh, may allow a real fine tuning or local regulation of how you control the decision to get, make sure all the chromosomes are properly lined up and then you go out of mitosis. All right, so let's back up for a minute. So the, the main enzyme being the APC right. cyclosome. How do, we, how do we think about that now? So there's been remarks the APC cyclosome. Um, it was this forbiddingly large uh, complex with 16 or uh, subunits or so, and we've been struggling to understand how it works. And the recent revolutions in structural biology and beautiful work has really given us a precise picture of its architecture and also the reasons for its complexity mm -hmm. because it has to both drive this reaction of catalysis of specific substrates in a very rapid manner but also be extremely sensitively regulated by the chromosomes mm -hmm. so that it doesn't inappropriately get turned on and that's the main reason why this is such a complex enzyme mm -hmm. but fundamentally its main activity is to do ubiquitin uh, ligation on two key substrates, uh, mm -hmm. the cyclin and securin, mm -hmm. and it's the degradation of those substrates that drive cells out of mitosis. Okay, and so how do the chromosomes talk to the APCC? Right. So we've known for over 20 years that one way the chromosomes talk to the APCC is that the kinetochores, when they're unattached, mm -hmm. are generating a weight anaphase signal and the point of the signal is to really prevent the APCC from degrading its substrates. And there's a lot of beautiful mechanistic work on that. Mm -hmm. In particular, the kinetochore is catalyzing a conformational conversion of a key protein called MAD2. Mm -hmm. And this then becomes part of a, a complex that goes on to inhibit the APCC. And the work I presented at the meeting was sort of suggesting there's another role of the kinetochore also in controlling the APCC. And what the kinetochore is doing is that it's um, altering the main enzyme uh, activator of the APCC known as CDC20, and it's activating CDC20 to turn on the APCC also. And so there's a balance between positive and negative regulation that's actually anchored on a specific binding site on the kinetochore. And so what are the contexts where you'd want the two different functional roles working. Yeah, so I, so if a kinetochore is unattached, so a chromosome has not yet found the spindle, mm -hmm. you do not want the cell to go out of mitosis. And so in that situation, you want to make sure that the kinetochore is stopping mm -hmm. the anaphase promoting complex. Now, if uh, the kinetochore is attached, you also want to make sure the APC turns on relatively quickly mm -hmm. so the cells don't spend inappropriately long time in mitosis. And so one way to achieve that is to convert the negative signal into a positive signal. And this may also enable local control of um, APCC activation, which is something we'd like to explore in the future. And when you say local, you mean spatial? Spatially localized control, yes. So yeah. that you're making this decision for one chromosome microtubule attachment at a time Right, so we're, you don't want to fully relieve cohesion between mm -hmm. uh, paired sisters immediately after attachment, but possibly you may alter locally the cohesion dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is just speculation at this stage, but uh, 
we know that there is positive and negative regulation going on. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll, one of our future goals is to understand exactly how, uh, what this is doing in cells. Mm -hmm. And what toggles between the activating and the inhibiting? So our, um, we believe the toggle is through microtubule attachment to kinetochores. It's been appreciated for a long time that when microtubules attach in a certain configuration, mm -hmm. the checkpoint signaling reaction is turned off. And so this would immediately tip the balance mm -hmm. towards the activation reaction. And a key part of the activation reaction is actually a dephosphorylation. Okay. So um, we also suspect that microtubule attachment is delivering the phosphatase to the kinetochore. The mechanism of that is unknown, but that would also alter the balance uh, based on attachment. And that's dephosphorylation of CDC20? Dephosphorylation of CDC20 to go on and bind to the APCC and then mm -hmm. drive cells out of mitosis. So it's a different way of thinking about CDC20. Yes, and actually our work was inspired by um, classic biochemical work, which had shown negative that CDC20 could be negatively regulated mm -hmm. by phosphorylation. And, but the in vivo follow-up on that has uh, not really been there. And so I think what we've contributed is to show that it's really controlling uh, the timing of APCC mm -hmm. activation and that the kinetochore is influencing that reaction. And so, so sort of taking a look beyond kind of figuring out this, this local right. mechanism, what do you think are the, the next big questions for understanding this, this interplay between you know, getting things attached right and right. moving the cell on through the cell cycle? Yeah, I mean, I th uh, so one of the things that always excited me about this area is that there's this very localized interplay between uh, mechanical events mm -hmm. where the kinetochore is the major machine that's responsible for coupling to the microtubules and driving uh, the movement of the chromosomes, and these signaling events that are deciding uh, what the cell should do. Mm -hmm. And so I think the really big questions are to understand precisely how the mechanics influences the signaling pathways and how they are talking to each other. And in contrast, I think that's a little challenging because we are not good at integrating forces into studies of uh, signaling type mechanisms. And that's the big challenge in the field. And I, I feel that's an area where we still understand relatively little about how the process is, is working. And this also ties in, I, I work in the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, and we know that most uh, solid cancers have aneuploidy or incorrect chromosome mm -hmm. numbers, and they also have chromosomal rearrangements, and the ultimate origin of those is problems with segregation in mitosis. Mm -hmm. So um, these, the signaling reactions that are occurring in this very confined space are also relevant to understanding the genesis of that phenotype, which is still quite mysterious um, in the sense that unlike DNA repair, we don't have clear links with mutations mm -hmm. uh, and the phenotype. There are rare mutations in chromosome segregation machinery in mm -hmm. cancer, but not at the prevalence that would explain the, the phenotype that we see in, in solid cancers. So we also are very interested in linking the sort of detailed mechanistic understanding to potential uh, dysregulation in cancer. And have the, the rare mutations pointed toward any likely suspects? Um, yeah, so um, includes, the rare mutations have pointed to the kinds of suspects that I, I presented, mm -hmm. and there's even mutations in the APCC that were just okay. recently described, uh, but above one and also proteins that are involved in the spindle checkpoint. But their prevalence is extremely low, but, um, so it's not a high prevalence mutation. Obviously, dysregulation by changes in expression or amplification mm -hmm. in this kind of very tightly coordinated pathway could be equally deleterious, and that's an area we are interested in because you do see misregulation of a lot of these components in different cancers, but that's, um, we need to model that in a clean way mm -hmm. so we can interpret it and see if there is really a link to the genesis of aneuploidy. And misregulation at the level of gene expression or at the level of protein stability or turn, I mean? Yeah, and, uh, most of the analysis is from genomics, so okay. there's both amplifications that are found and also uh, gene expression changes. And so uh, this, a lot of this is coming out of things like the TCGA okay. analysis. Um, and 
we are also curious whether there are germline yeah. uh, changes that could explain susceptibility or change how tumors are different. Um, and that's something that we're also exploring. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I want to circle back to something you said about understanding how force plays into this because in, in a solid tumor, forces can be different, right? Yes. Because of the stiffness of the, the cellular matrix. And so let's go back and talk about, you said there, are, we're not good at integrating yeah. force with these kinds of studies. What kind of technology does that, is that gonna take? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, we can do force, uh, we can do force analysis in purified systems with systems like optical traps, but right. it's very challenging to integrate analysis of signaling mm -hmm. in there. So I think one area of excitement um, is to use these force biosensors mm -hmm. in cellular contexts. And while that's always a bit difficult to interpret, I think that's sort of the best tool we have at this moment to assess potential forces and how they influence uh, reactions. Um, the other big challenge is a lot of these reactions involve things with rapid half-lives and post-translational okay. modifications. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another challenge as to how we can understand those, and uh, we believe that you know it's a golden era for high-resolution cell biology. Mm -hmm. Like we have beautiful tools and systems to really uh, try to understand how these complex pathways work. Uh, but at the same time, we are always in the need for new technologies, and so we are looking for clever people to come up with <laughs> unexpected, unex uh, you know, things we don't anticipate to try and tackle these questions. And so um, the work that you presented today was largely in worms. Yeah. But you don't just work on worms. And so what kinds of questions right. are you going to take into different systems? Yeah, so we also work with uh, human cells mm -hmm. quite a bit. And, but there our work is much more uh, directed at understanding how the, the spindle, the centrosome that organizes the spindle is involved in formation of the spindle, mm -hmm. and also how it contributes to the process of uh, accurate division. And uh, that involves collaborative work where we've developed uh, very clean small molecule inhibitors that allow us to remove centrosomes from cells and then see what happens to division, accuracy of chromosome segregation, and also potential therapeutic approaches uh, mm -hmm. that derive from that. Uh, so. Uh, we're not analyzing the detailed kinetochore biology in mm -hmm. human cells. There's a lot of our colleagues are doing fantastic mm -hmm. work on that. Um, but uh, we focus much more on trying to uh, also get at this question of genesis of cancer cell aneuploidy mm -hmm. and where does that come from. So um, more exploratory mm -hmm. and more targeted on centrosomes and, mm -hmm. and spindles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for the aneuploidy field, what do you think are the, the most exciting things going on right now? Well, I think it's a super exciting time. I think the realization that a single uh, lagging chromosome in mitosis can trigger these vast genomic sort of uh, rearrangements was, has been a major sort of change in our thinking. Uh, the other thing that's really exciting is, you know, really getting a sense of what aneuploidy is doing to cells, and I, I think that's a very complex field. Um, one of the struggles we have, and we were discussing this at the meeting, is we don't have a good uh, measure of aneuploidy. Uh, we don't, we can, we can count something with a chromosome as aneuploidy as well as extra chromosome, or mm -hmm. something with 40 extra chromosomes right. as aneuploidy, and we haven't really figured out how to sort of uh, address that challenge and, and compare that in a clean way to phenotypes. Um, mm -hmm. So there's been beautiful work done by modeling aneuploidy with single extra chromosomes, uh, but in terms of relating that to the, the spectrum of changes we see in cancers, I think that's still uh, been challenging to, to tackle. Um, I would say the biggest question I still have personally is where does it come from? Mm -hmm. What's the genesis of this? And it's clear that once you have these events that then you can actually trigger more aneuploidy and mm -hmm. more problems. So is this just chance? And I, I know this is a big debate mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, in the cancer field, or is this uh, actually reflecting some vulnerability that, mm -hmm. that we don't understand yet? And I think that's something we would love to contribute to in the future. And so, so get chance versus yeah. something maybe predetermined. Some, predetermined something, is the wrong yeah. word, but where, 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 where are you starting from? 
Yeah, so right now we're, we're just uh, trying to take cells that are most wild type for us, for human cells, that would be ES cells, mm -hmm. that's the closest. So we are very influenced by genetic model sort of thinking <laughs> and, and just trying to insert, sort of alter specific uh, classic cancer related pathways and, and assess whether there's any obvious induction of aneuploidy phenotypes. To be honest, the bigger challenge we have is we really want to develop a quantitative assay that gives us a quick readout. Oh, yeah. And that's something we're, we're trying to work on quite, quite intensively right now. Because I think that'll open up a lot yeah. of work. And uh, with the advent of single cell sequencing, we can do sort of analysis of genome imbalances, but it, it's, it's still not a very high throughput mm -hmm. approach. And I think we need to be able to score tens of thousands, if not millions of events mm -hmm. to really look at the relevant frequencies here. Yeah. And from model organisms, we know the frequency of missegregation is extremely low, yeah. but we still don't have a very good handle of that in mammals. And I, I think that's a big question for the aneuploidy field to get a rigorous baseline mm -hmm. measurement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I want to switch gears completely. Sure. And imagine that you're just starting your oh. lab. And you can't work on kinetochores or cell cycle. Ah, that's a good like, question. Right now, like given the scope of what's going on in science, you have funding resources. <laughs> what what would you what would you want to work on? Yeah, I, actually, that, that's a really good question. Um, so, I would say there the areas that sort of fascinate. So, I'm just going to go out of cell biology, out of my comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, really like the work on, um, on microbial communities. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy that um, and learning how they function as a unit more than themselves mm -hmm. and also how they interact and influence, say, hosts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm talking more on the functional side, yeah. not so much the genomics yeah. uh, side. I, I think that's a fascinating problem that is getting its due recognition because mm -hmm. they are everywhere. And I think when people talk about biomass, it's probably all microbes, really. <laughs> so, and and the, there's so much unexplored biology there in terms of the kinds of reactions and the kinds of uh, components and pathways that we just have. So it's just an open terrain in yeah. terms of exploration. So I think that area sort of excites me a lot. And one other area that I've actually been stimulated to go into partly by our observations um, where we've found that a lot of the chromosome segregation machinery is doing really unexpected stuff in development, mm -hmm. stuff we didn't anticipate. And that's also made me think a lot about how things work inside, so an embryo where you have a lot of cells and a lot of neighbors, and you have all these complex morphogenetic events occurring, and how do you achieve that? Is, and how do you go, I mean, in C. elegans, we can watch it go from one cell and uh, we just leave it in the microscope overnight, and there's a larvae the next day. And so this is, this is truly remarkable. And um, trying to take this sort of mechanistic worldview mm -hmm. into those, and I think that's something that I, would, I will probably do yeah. <laughs> more. Uh, but the microbial stuff is something that's a little, I, I definitely find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one other area I, I do think is really exciting is, again, um, you know, the detailed biophysics of macromolecular mm -hmm. machines. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that I have always admired. I have a lot of friends who work mm -hmm. in that area. And I, I think you, you can derive really fundamental principles from, from those kinds of approaches. So yeah. that's another area I find really exciting. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, thank yeah. you very much for talking with me. Sure. It was a pleasure. Thank oh. you, Lara. <laughs>